Hello and welcome back to the Discrete Mathematics. Uh, to this week or today we're going to be looking at functions um, and not functions in the way that you're traditionally going to think about functions. Uh, functions you've had in math classes where they've been very complex. Uh, you've had functions in programming classes where uh, they were very sort of engineered and practical. Uh, but we really want to think about functions today and obviously they're all related. Uh, but we're going to think functions um, as sort of a, an extension of sets and set theory. Um, to give us a way of sort of defining these more complex sets later on, or more complex functions later on. So you've seen functions like this before, uh, high school algebra, whatever, uh, where the f of x is equal to some polynomial or just some expression of x, right? Um, and if you, you know, you could solve for this to try and figure out, you know, factors or whatever, but um, the idea here really at its base is that if you plug any number in for x, then you can get a value. So um, here, uh, if we plug in 3, for instance, into this function, uh, we're going to get uh, 3 squared is 9 plus uh, 12 uh, minus 12, so that kind of goes away and we just end up with 9, right? But by plugging a value in for x into our function, we are going to get a specific value. That is what is sort of the, the nature of a function, right? That I have these two sort of variables, right, these two numbers. And one is if I take any number and I plug it in for x, any number I want, so long as it's in, within the domain of what we're talking about, if I take that number and I plug it in for x, then I'm going to end up with a response back, a single answer back for that one number that I plug in. That's what defines something as a function. So uh, we would say that a function uh, from set x to set y is a well-defined rule that assigns a single element of y to each element of x. So in other words, if I have two sets, right, a set x and a set y, then I sort of get this mapping of relationships between the values in set x to the values in set y. And the idea is that for every, or for, uh, every element of x, I'm going to assign or map a relationship to a single value in y. So, uh, right. Basically, there's a there's a there's an element of y that is assigned to each element of x. Uh, and so the idea here is we could then write that as a function. We would say uh, f is sort of a function mapping set x to set y. Um, and then we can you know, sort of show those individual relationships. Um, the set x in this case, the thing that's sort of on the left of that arrow, uh, is called the domain, right? And so the domain is what we're, you know, sort of the universe of discourse that we're talking about. So this could be all real numbers. It could be just the integers. Uh, it could be, you know, positive numbers. It could be uh, a very set, specific set of, you know, subset of numbers. Um, it could be some other thing that we want to talk about. Uh, the set of all people in the world, uh, the set of all Californians, the set of all registered voters, whatever it happens to be, right? Set X is called the domain. Set Y is called the codomain. And the idea of the codomain is that the codomain is almost, it's completely dependent on the elements in the domain. So in other words, the elements in the domain, you get to choose, right? You can choose any element in the domain. And for any element in the domain, you're going to get a specific element, sort of a dictated element in the codomain. You'll hear another term used often in uh, like high school algebra courses where we'll talk about the dependent variable and the independent variable. In this case, x is our independent variable. We can choose anything we want in x, but for anything we choose in x, we are sort of assigned like a very specific value of y. y is completely dependent on your value of x. You choose x, y is then dependent on your choice. So y is the dependent variable, x is the independent variable. So let's just look at a quick example here. This is going to be with two very simple subsets. So let x be the set 1, 2, 3. Let y equal the set 1, be the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? Very simple counting numbers. Um, and so we create a formula, right? some sort of a relationship. We say that the f of x is equal to x plus 1. So this is going to define a function from you know, mapping set x to set y. And for this function, you know that f of 1 is 2, f of 2 is 3, and f of 3 is 4. Now we only have to worry about those three values because there's only three values in the domain. 
There's only three values in the X set, right? Um, and so we don't have to worry about any other numbers. We've, we've created very, very finite sets here. Um, and so that makes it easier. We can simply draw this map, right? We can actually show the set X with one, two, and three, the set Y with one, two, three, and four, and we can draw the individual relationships between each value. So uh, if I choose one for X, that's going to map to the two in Y, in the codomain. Two maps to three, three maps to four. Now here's something you might notice. Well, you won't notice one thing. One is that values of X, different values of X can point to the same Y that is allowed. You can do that. Um, and there can be some values of Y that don't have anything pointing to them, right? Uh, if you do have one of these properties, then we'll have some specific names for your, your function. But right now, just to be a function, that's perfectly okay. Um, and you kind of know this from high school algebra, right? Like um, that vertical line test, right? Parabolas are a function, even though for, you know, for most x's, unless it's the vertex, right? For most x's, you'll get a y that you could also get with another x. So two different x's will point to the same y, perfectly fine, because for each x that you choose, you still got exactly one y, even if it happened to be the same y as another x. It's still a function. Uh, where it's not a function is if you take that parabola and you tilt it sideways, and then you do the vertical line test or whatever, and it's like, oh, for this x, I actually get two y's. That's ambiguous, no longer a function. Um, and in this case, we're looking at something that's a little bit more algebraic, x squared minus 3x plus 2. This is still a function, right? It's the kind you're used to in algebra. Uh, it's just a function that maps uh, the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers, right? It can be the same set in this case. Um, but because, you know, the reason that we're dealing with simpler functions is that when you get to something like this, there's no way to represent that graphically, right? We can't draw this because the domain is infinitely large. But you can still kind of visualize the, the concept, right, for the algebraic function that you've seen, you know, for many, many years now, right? The idea that like, oh yeah, if I picture the set of real numbers as a set, I could see how this is setting up a mapping where for any x that I put in, I could draw a value to another x in the codomain. It's just that I have infinite values here and infinite values here. So, you know, it's, it's just impossible to draw, but you can still kind of visualize it. Uh, by the way, I've used this term already uh, because it's, once you start thinking about functions and sets, the idea of mapping just makes sense, right? It's, I'm mapping specific values in the domain to specific values in the codomain um, using these sort of simple lines and drawings, which means that I can then convert a function into something using, uh, you know, graph theory, right? So I can convert a function into a graph. If I were to do that, the way I would represent it is that every vertice of the graph would represent elements of the domain and codomain. Uh, they can be the same if it's the same set, but we'll get to that in a second. And the idea is that these vertices represent the elements in those in the domain and codomain. And then I'm going to create a directed graph where I have a directed edge for each element in the domain to point to some element in the codomain. Um, so here's an example. Uh, if I have a set, uh, we're going to call it n, that is just negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, right? A very finite set because we want to be able to draw this. Um, and then we can define a function, uh, s of n, to be n squared minus 2. So if I look at the first element in n, negative 2, and I were to run that through our function, I would see that negative 2 squared is 4, minus 2 is 2. So I have my four elements. You know, and because here the you know this function maps the set n to the set n, um, we have sort of like the same set for both the domain and codomain. So I've just drawn them as the same set of vertices. Um, but here, negative two has a directed edge that points to two, because if you plug negative two in for n, then you end up with two. But now notice the way that squaring works. If I plug two in for n squared, or for n, then I get n squared is four minus two, which is also two. So two sort of points back to itself. 
Um, and you can kind of do the work for everything else. If I plug in a zero, I just end up with zero minus two, which is negative two, so zero points to two. Uh, one points to negative one, and negative one points to itself for that same kind of square reason. Um, but this is the idea, right, that we are um, just drawing the relationships between those elements. Now here, because the sets were the same, um, I went ahead and just used the same set of vertices for both. But you don't have to do it that way, right? Uh, you could actually draw the domain separate from the codomain, which would look something like this. You'd have the same values on both sides in this case because they're the exact same sets, uh, but they wouldn't have to be, right? You could have one set be different than the other, and you would just draw lines between the two. Either way, it does the exact same thing, but these are both graphs that show the relationship that we are defining as that function, f of, sorry, s of n in this case. Now, in terms of graphs, we're going to see that functions have very specific features. So in this case, every single element of the domain, which because they're the same set for the domain and codomain, that means every single vertice here, has an out degree of exactly one, right? And that makes sense. For it to be a function, it has to have an out degree of one because um, every x you choose must lead to exactly one y. But notice that every vertice of the codomain does not necessarily have an end degree of one, right? It could have an end degree of zero or it could have an end degree of more than one, right? Theoretically, you could have every single number in, you know, you know, the, the set of real numbers all pointing to the exact same value, right? Let's say it was zero. If you did that and you were to graph it, you would actually be graphing the x-axis, right? Where x is equal to zero, uh, or sorry, y is equal to zero. So for any x you choose, y is equal to zero, um, which is a function. It is a valid function uh, because for any x you choose, you get exactly one value, even though it's the same value for every x that you choose. Um, and so the n degree doesn't matter so much when it comes to functions, but every element of the domain must have exactly an out degree of one. You get one answer for every x. So um, this f of x notation uh, tends to sort of illustrate that idea, right? That my the value of the f of x is completely determined by what what I send to that function, right? What the x is. So for every x, there has to be, um, for every single x, there has to be a single value in the codomain that it maps to. So we can say that you can fail to write a function or a, you know, a well-defined function in one of two ways, right? One, you could have some x in the domain that does not have a relationship to some y in the codomain. Right, so you've got some value that doesn't, you know, doesn't have a mapping um, in the domain. The other way you can do it is you could have some x in the domain that's mapped to two or more different values in the codomain. If that's the case, then again, you're not choosing just one, so it fails. Uh, going back to my parabola example, you can kind of see that, right? A parabola is a function. Theoretically, that u-shaped value will go out forever and ever and ever, and so for any x that you choose, you will get exactly one value of y. It passes the vertical line test. But if I take that exact same shape and I just pivot it 90 degrees, this is not a function, right? Even though it's the same shape. And that's because past the vertex, which is now, I guess, to the, well, to my left, right? Um, past the vertex, I'm going to have two values for every single y, right? If I choose a y, or sorry, if I choose an x, I'm going to have two values of y that result. So this is breaking the second rule, right? I've got more than one, you know, y mapped for every x. It's ambiguous. Past the vertex, right, to, or I guess let's say below the vertex, but I guess in this case, since we pivoted to the side, to the left of the vertex, right? we're going to have absolutely no values. So we're, now we're breaking rule one, right? We've chosen x's, but there is no value of the f of x that maps to it. So again, parabola is a function, you pivot it, no longer a function. And the reason for that is that you're breaking that sort of fundamental rule of an independent variable and a dependent variable. I should choose any x and get exactly one y. So uh, a good example of this, not using math. 
let's look at something that's a bit more real world, a little bit looser and more philosophical or whatever. If we let P be the set of all people, alive or dead, that have ever existed on planet Earth, right? I can set up a function M, which maps the set of people to the set of people, such that the M of X is the birth mother or biological mother of X. Now, barring some really weird DNA in a laboratory type stuff, right? If we just use it simple biology, so let's consider that a, a constraint um, or an assumption, then we know that every single person, right? Whatever I choose for X, any person I've ever chose who's ever lived on this planet, I can take that person and they have a biological mother, right? They have some somebody who contributed DNA uh, from sort of the mother's side, right? They have a biological mother. Um, and so because of that, now mind you, there can be multiple people who have the same mother. That's allowed. That's okay with functions. But for any one person I choose, they will have exactly one biological mother. And every person I choose will have one and no more than one, right? That makes them a, that makes the M of X a very well-defined function. It matches our idea of what a function is. So let's take a very similar function or attempt to be a function and see how this pans out. If we let P again to be the set of all people who've ever lived on planet Earth, and we create a function C, which maps the set of people to the set of people such that the C of X is the child of X, the C of X is not a well-defined function. C of X would not be a function at all. And it wouldn't be a function at all because for one, uh, our first rule is for every value of X, you must have a C of X, right? There must be a value in the other, in the codomain. Uh, well, some people don't have children. So there are people I could choose that don't have children. Several of you probably fit into that category. And so for that X, there is no value of C of X. That's not a function. The other thing is that some people have more than one ch child, right? Because some people have more than one child, if I choose any X, you might get two values or three values or four values because biologically humans can have more than one child throughout their lifetime. Um, thank goodness. If they didn't, we'd be extinct as a species by now. Um, so there you go. We have the M of X is a function. Every single person has exactly one biological mother, but the C of X is not a function because you could have none or more than one child per person. So a couple um, things that might describe specific functions. So we could say that a function is a one-to-one -one function, right? Um, it is injective. If uh, basically... Every single X points to a unique value of Y. In other words, we never have that situation where uh, two values of X point to the same Y. And you can kind of see that here in the, in the graph that we've drawn. Um, every element of X points to a different value of Y. Now, some of the values of Y are not pointed to, and that's fine. You can still be one-to-one -one and not be on two, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, you can be one-to-one -one, um, and point to different values of Y. So long as you're always pointing to a different value and no value of y has two x's pointing to it, we would say that you are a one-to-one -one function, right? For every value of x, I get a unique value of y, uh, or a unique element of the y set. Now, something is considered on two or surjective. Uh, if for every, every element of x points to a value of y, but every value in y has something pointing to it. Right? So if there's no element in the codomain that is not pointed to, that doesn't map to some element of X, then we would say that it's onto, that, uh, that X sort of maps onto Y. So every element of X has to be chosen, right? Because that's the definition of a function. But then it points to every single element, or some point to at least every single element of Y. Now you notice here, two are pointing to the same element of Y, perfectly allowed. That's accepted in functions. And you can be an onto function or a surjective function that way, right? Where you have elements of Y that every single element is pointed to, some are pointed to more than once. Perfectly acceptable. By the way, uh, the book doesn't mention this explicitly, but there's also bijective. Bijective just means that you are a one-to-one -one correspondence. You are both 
onto and one-to-one. -one. That is, every element of x points to exactly one element, a unique element of y, and every element of y is pointed to. So you know, there's a relationship between every value of x and every value of y, and that relationship is unique for every x. Um, we would call that a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijective function. But regardless, we'll talk about why that's helpful in a second. Um, composition. You can compose functions together. Uh, don't make this more difficult than it is. Uh, the composition of functions is really just saying like the g of the f of x, right? It's that thing that you do when you nest function calls together is the composition of functions. So here if we say that f is a function that maps x to y and g is a function that maps y to z, then the g of f is the basically a function that maps from x to z, uh, which is defined by the g of f of x is the same thing as the g of f of x. Like in English, we say it the exact same way, even though I'm using that little circle for of uh, in the composition sort of discrete mathematics language, it just translates to I'm going to do the f of x and then I'm going to do the g of x. But here's the important thing with composition is just to note that you still work from the inside out. So even though the the notation has changed, g circle f, g of f, um, the g of f, I'm still going to apply the f first, inside first, and then do the g, right? And so this is going to give us different values. So for instance, if I have a function f from real number to real number that's defined by the f of x is equal to the floor of x, uh, that's what those little symbols mean, kind of coming down with a little feet at the bottom, that is the floor symbol, if you haven't seen it before in mathematics. Um, it just means basically I'm going to round down, and you always round down. So negative 3.4, you would round down to negative 4, not negative 3. Negative 3 would actually be going up, right? Because it's, it's actually a higher number than negative 4. So floor is go down to the nearest whole number. If the same symbol but the little feet were at the top, that would be a ceiling. The ceiling of a number is go up to the next integer. So floor go down to the to the you know the next lowest integer, ceiling go up to the next highest integer. And then we're going to find the function g to just be the g of x is equal to 3x. So g just means to triple something. So here we've got the g of f of 2.4. It's the exact same thing as applying the f to the 2.4, which will give you 2 then apply the g, which will give you 6. Now notice this is exactly different. These are going to be the exact same functions, but we're just going to flip the order. So this is not the g of f, this is the f of g of 2.4. Exact same uh, input value, right? But this is going to be different because we're applying it in a different order. So now I'm going to apply the g to 2.4, which will give us 7.2. And then I apply the f, which is the floor, to 7.2, and that gives us 7, not 6. So the order matters, right? The f of g is not the same thing as the g of f. The order in which you compose things matters. All right, last couple concepts here. One is an inverse function. So an inverse function, if you picture, I have a set, I have a domain set x, right? And that maps to a codomain set y. I have a value of x that, you know, maps to a value in y. If I were to find a way to undo that, to go back, to say, hey, if you give me a y, I want to tell you the x that led to that y. That's the inverse function. We denote the inverse function by sort of saying f and then using superscript negative 1. So that's the inverse of f. That's how you'd say it in English. Um, and so if f is a function that maps set x to set y, uh, the inverse function maps set y to set x. And it has the property that if you were to compose the two, um, if you were to do the inverse of f of f, you would end up with the exact same number you started with, right? So uh, if I take a number, if I take an x, and then I apply f to it, I'm going to get the y. And then if I take that y and I apply the inverse to it, I'll go right back to the x. Now, it should be noted that not all functions have inverses, and that's because the inverse function has to be a function itself for it to be a function. And so the only way you can have an inverse function is if your function is bijective, if it is a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Because basically, if I take a, an element y and I apply the 
the inverse to it, I have to get an F that will then send me back to Y. So basically for any element Y, it has to, you have to map X onto Y. In other words, if, it, if I have a situation where there are uh, values of Y that don't get mapped to by elements of X, right? I have a few Y's that don't have any arrows pointing to them. If I were to choose that Y, there would be no X to map back to. So then that's not a function, right? So there is no inverse function unless X maps onto Y. Every element of Y must have an arrow pointing to it, right? In the same way, I have to say that F has to be one to one. Every element of X must map like one to one onto a unique value of Y. And the reason for that is because the inverse function also has to be a function. So if it's not a one to one function, then I might have two elements of X that point to a single Y. And if I take that Y and I go try to map it back, I'm going to have two elements that I'm pointing to. Well, that's no longer a function. So for there to be an inverse function, your initial function must be a one-to-one -one correspondence. It must be both onto and one-to-one. -one. Every element of Y must be uh, pointed to, and every element of X must point to a unique Y. That will allow you to have an inverse function. Uh, this last one is sort of a throw on the book throws in, which is just a restriction. Uh, fairly simple. The idea is if you have a function that maps X to Y, you could then take some, you could create a new function, right, by taking some subset of X, which they call H here, um, and say that we're going to restrict F to H so that we have this new function, F restricted to H, which maps the set H, which is the subset of X to Y, and then it's the exact same function, right? So all we're doing is just producing the subset. If I have a function that maps the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers, I could then create Say, I just want the exact same function, but I want to make the domain only the integers or only positive numbers or whatever it is. You know, I, maybe there's some useful feature that I kind of want to restrict my domain to to create a new, uh, a new function. But notice this, the codomain um, does not change. So even if I restrict you know, my, my domain to just positive integers, um, if my the, the codomain is the set of real numbers, I might be able to plug in a positive integer and still end up with a you know negative 2.6, right? I haven't changed the codomain. I'm just changing the domain uh, because it just makes sense to restrict it. Um, again, there are some things in the real world that cannot be negative. You cannot have a negative distance. Well, you can't have a negative distance if you consider it a but if for whatever reason, right, like it just doesn't make sense to have a negative number, um, then you might want to restrict your function to be only certain values. Anyway, that's just a restriction. It's something you can throw on. But again, for it to work, uh, it has to, your, the set that you're changing the domain to must be a subset of the original domain. Um, and that's it. That is restriction and functions. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message in Canvas, and uh, I will see you online.